Namaskar. Welcome to the Responsible Medicine Cyber Psychology Conference organized by Ahan Foundation and supported by Kriti Foundation, Cyber Council, Amicus, along with Maharashtra Times as the media partner. I, Swart Randi, faculty member at BC, extend a warm welcome to one and all uh, on behalf of Dalitra as Dalitra is the knowledge partner of this program. We'd like to begin this conference with the national anthem and I request all of you to stand up.
This has been our dream. This conference has really been our dream, and each of you have been instrumental in make, fulfilling it for us. So I thank you on behalf of our Hand Foundation. We are truly honoured by your presence. Thank you, Dr. Sarunke, for being such wonderful hosts. Dr. Mukundan for your valuable support and for coming flying on all the way from Rujia to support this cause. Mr. Kazi for in accepting our invitation at the last minute and supporting us again for this cause. This conference is aimed at enabling all of us to interface our online and offline lives and understand what we can do together collectively to build action to build a cyber safe city. I would quickly like to take you through a short film that has been made on responsible netizen to give you an overview of our work. Internet has opened doors for global connect. It has evolved and influenced how we interact, how we conduct business, how we learn and has broken barriers by accelerating growth and development. The divide between adults as digital immigrants and children as digital natives has to be bridged. The fascination about the power to control technology often blinds us towards threats we pose online, leading to irresponsible usage, increasing their vulnerability to cybercrime. This impacts our body, mind and even modifies our behavior threatening our mental well-being. 300% rise in cybercrime as per National Crime Record Bureau. Internet dependency, addiction to gaming, pornography and social media is no more a myth. To cope with these new challenges and interface our online and offline lives, Ahan Foundation launched Project Responsible Netizen in 2012. Project Responsible Netizen promotes digital empowerment and cyber wellness to build smart people living within smart cities. To fulfill our objectives, we conduct Awareness Module for Students and Parents Being Responsible Netizens Digital Literacy Program Joy of Internet Digital Financial Literacy Program for Cashless Economy Women Empowerment Program Digital Stri Shakti Our programs have enabled us to sensitize 4.5 lakh children and adults Team Responsible Netizen is committed to creating awareness about cyber safety and shaping every individual into a responsible netizen to build a cyber safe world we aspire to make online safety a basic human right and strongly believe in collective action to promote responsible living. Let's go digital and be safe. Thank you. It feels great to see our journey and our struggle of four long years capsuled just in a two minute film. I can certainly assure you that this journey has not been a very uh, smooth one. There have been a lot of challenges that we faced, especially because back in 2012, online safety was considered least important and of least concern, and it needed no intervention whatsoever. Four years, dar dar ki thokre kha ke hume thodi abhi izdar mili hai, aur wo 2014 mein hume best ENGO award mila from Digital Empowerment Foundation. I think that was the service for us. That also helped us earn another acknowledgement from the Ministry of Education of Maharashtra. And we now work with about 400 schools in the city to promote cyber wellness and online safety. For the last four years, we've been working with teachers, parents, and students in order to build a platform for people to think, click, and share, because that's what we least tend to do. It is important for us to all think before we post and also be responsible for our own activity online. Some of our upcoming projects are the Project Cyber Buddy. It is an initiative to provide first aid for online distress in schools where we would be mentoring children from high school to initiate action on cyber safety for any online distress that happens in schools. Another project that we've launched is called the Parent Protecting Children Online. This is a platform where parents uh, 
uh, will be empowered about digital parenting because we find there's a huge divide between the technical quotient of children and parents. And parents are usually at, at children's feet because they don't know anything about technology. Empowering them will be a stepping stone towards building families which are safe online and will realize the importance of online safety. Having met eminent people from the field of law enforcement, IT and mental health for guidance, we graduated from saying no to technology to embracing it with pride, confidence and building a sense of accountability into people. The Responsible Netism National Cyber Psychology Conference bin brings together over 37 national and international speakers to share their wisdom on cyber psychology and its advancement for the first time in Maharashtra. This conference aims at enabling people to strike a balance between their online and offline lives to get empowered in the virtual world. We take this opportunity to thank you all once again for supporting us, for believing in us and our cause and really look forward to an awe-inspiring journey of enlightenment. This being our first conference, we are sure we've goofed up somewhere and our humble apologies for any inconvenience caused. I usually begin with our disclaimer which I forgot to mention because I am also very nervous for the first time. And it says we are not against technology but we are here to empower people to use it with creativity and with sense of accountability. A warm welcome to one of you, all of you here today. And we wish to work together post the conference. I hope you enjoy the two days of the empowerment that we offer. Thank you once again. Thank you, Sonali, for setting the context. And uh, we can see that this conference is an outcome of the last four or five years of work. And so no apologies required. We are all here for a common purpose. And everything else is just right aside. We have a distinguished panel of experts and speakers here with us for this program. I'd like to introduce them. And also, I would like to invite them to inaugurate the program by lighting the lamp. We have with us Emeritus Professor Dr. C. R. Mukundan. Sir is Chairman of Axonet Brain Research Lab, which is based in Bangalore and recognized by Milham and DDT. He's former Director, Institute of Behavioral Sciences at Gujarat Forensic Science University. We have with us Mr. Hasif Kazi, who is Vice President and Head of Strategic Initiatives at Tata Consultancy Services. I'd like to invite Professor Dr. Uday Sawanji, who is the group director of the school, and Dr. Anurag Hasobi, who is head of the Department of Psychology at the Kennedy Women's University. Can we request you all to inaugurate the program by lighting the lamp? If you're talking about technology, I think there is some technology in the lamp as well. So 
Sally, would like you to tell us today, Dr. Anuradha. I know you're part of the team. partner of this program, uh, I think we would like to hear Dr. Sawanke's thoughts on this occasion. With that kind of thought process, 
if we move together, then we can make sense. One of our core value we deliberately embedded as we link and care. Same way, whether in the physical way or maybe in the digital ecosystem as such. Somewhere deep down, we always talk about physical, mental and spiritual fitness leads to a physical fitness. But now we need to add one more after listening to Sonali and Unne a short time. A physical, mental, spiritual and cyber fitness leads to a physical fitness. So otherwise you can't be CEO of a company unless until you are in this world and really taking care of a lot of those factors. The two small cases which I'll narrate with you why I'm really convinced about this theme. One of our student maybe in some kind of rage, some kind of anger, not able to cope up with the studies, posted something about teacher anonymously and teacher filed a complaint. The case was handed over to police. It was actually in Bangalore campus, so Bangalore police, Bombay police. They praised the student and student was behind the bars for a couple of days. And when we invited parents in this entire investigation, we felt so sorry. Now, I had tears in my eyes. These parents were so innocent. They know parents were not aware of what's happening. They were pleading. They were trying to be as apologetic as possible. But in fact, nothing was in our hand. Everything was taken over by the police. But at that time, even we can't intervene to stop any kind of investigation. And that case was kind of eye opener for even our students that how responsive we must behave. At the same time, when I took a all of students' usage with respect to social networking platforms in the same auditorium. Almost out of 200 plus students in the same auditorium said, close to 40 to 50 percent of their time in a the day, they spent on all the gadgets. Then I asked them, I said, how much time do you invest for the productive use and non-productive? Productive use maybe just near about 60 to 70 percent, and 30 to 40 percent non-productive. All the time we talk about in a place like this, business school, that today's currency is time, not money. We can spend money, but we can't spend time. And if 30 to 40 percent of your time, if you're investing only on maybe some kind of fun chat, I think it's a high time for us that we need to take stock of what's the priorities in the life. And while just pondering on this theme, I really felt that netism is synonymous to netism. Niti, which we talk about, wherein we need to play the rules of the game, the responsibility, and very consciously. With these few words, I am also indeed looking forward to Dr. Mukundan, Asit Tariji, and some of the other speakers here. But I am confident such kind of efforts are on foundation. We will also look forward to working together in the future, and all of us will benefit it to create a better world to leave for us for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sure cyber fitness is something that will stay with us. And uh, this will percolate among the thousands of our students as well as an outcome of this program. I now request Mukundanji to present his speech. And he can, he can do it from there as well if you like to.
lot of places you may find not of a connectivity, but I am not connected with that. That you have to work on your own and look for that connectivity. I just want to start with uh, probably some basic aspects. Why something like this has become so very important for all of us. See, we speak about two important methods of knowing the reality. Man means the real world. One is scientific method. The other one is experiential. Scientifically, if one tries to, we will say that there are 200, 300 human beings here, like we say there are 300 dogs, there are 300 human beings here, and each one is this, 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 and they all have these parts, they all have these, the way they function, and scientifically we are the same. But, did we say that I am the same as you, you are the same as me? No, because experience each of us is different from the other. You cannot say that my experience is mine. That is not known to you. That is something very personal. My experience. You have your own experience. That's a different thing. Science helps us to share everything. No problem. The scientific world. But when it comes to experiential world, each person has his own, her own existence. Now, when it comes to this, you will find there are a number of more things that are to be understood in this area. See, we, when we speak about contact with reality, how do we know this world? How do we know another person? How do we know the, 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 the say, I mean, furniture here. How do you know there is another person here? We make sensory motor contacts with it. Sensory motor contacts could be very, very, varying and very complex. But then you are able to, brain is able to make this sensory motor contacts. And these contacts can be made only when you are awake. One way. Then that is one way you know that there is a reality. And then you know that what happens? There is an activation of various areas in the brain when you make the contact. The cognitive functions will activate many areas in the brain and the frontal lobe activation takes place. All these are well known established. Similarly, during motor movements, I want to go there and then talk to you. So that I have, if I want to talk to you closely, I don't walk down and come there. So that I have to do another act to make that sensory relationship. So a lot of motor activities facilitate sensory contact. They are together what we use it. And that is the most essential aspect of human scientifically knowing the world. Very important aspect. This cognitive process. Now there is something more in human being. Not only in human being, Today we know that human plants have the same. May not, we don't know how much is this, this same means. What is that? Suppose you have a BMW car. You want a BMW car. Then you have a black of course or anything. And you get ready in the morning. You come out. You get into the car. And you say start. No start. Why? And then you remember, you are not put petrol in the car. If there is no petrol in the car, the BMW car is useless. It won't take you anywhere. What is that petrol between you and me? There is something that is no nearest. Any idea? That is emotion. Emotional arousal. Without emotional arousal, we today we can tell you with authenticity. You are just nothing. You will, I may be alive, I can talk, I can do things, but I do nothing. This emotional arousal is needed as a drive, as a petrol 
Now there is something very funny, very interesting that happens. When you suppose I want to go from here to Pune, then this is a type of you know miracle that happens within the self. This that petrol will say, I am the petrol man for Pune. I am going to Pune. The petrol gets identified as the energy drive needed for going to Pune. Another person will say, for oh, my energy, I need to go to Gujarat. You find that this cognitive processing helps you and creates different types of identities for the same emotional arousal. Actually, it's the same pattern, the same fuel. You use it in very situation, very thing, and you keep on making judgments and giving them positive and negative, positive and negative, positive and negative labels. This is called cognitive molding of emotion. We see world, a lot of problems occur. Today you find that when you look at the brain activation, as I told you that you have all these cortical areas activated during sensory motor contact. When I am dreaming, the same areas are again activated, though I am not making <coughs> any contact. And, but that's when you say that it's only dream, dreaming. I am not making contact, but in dream I am making a contact. A schizophrenic patient will say, he is also making contact, he is only hallucinating. A person sitting with, today, in the internet, he is also making the same contact. But, there is a lot of difference. This is where we have developed the concept that we are living in a virtual world. This is a virtual world, because there is no real contact. You feel that you are with your friend, standing together and talking, but actually you are just communicating. That becomes a sort of virtual world. And this is what our own philosophers, ages, ages, several thousand years back, called the world of Maya. Scientifically you can prove this is a fact. But then, let me ask you a simple difference. I hope I am not taking too much time. I will take for a few more minutes to talk. I must tell you this difference. I am feeling like having a cup of tea. I decide, okay, I will just go down. You may not be here on the place. I will go out on the roadside. There is a small cafeteria or there is a fellow still selling tea under a small tree sit down on a bed and drink the tea. Whereas one of you will say, oh, I want a cup of tea. What will I do? Take my phone, bring it, call the cat, and then get to the cat. I just come. Well, you are going to a five-star hotel. Go to a five-star hotel, sit there and have a cup of tea. Are these different experiences? Have you had the same tea? Scientifically, we have had the same tea, same water, same milk, same sugar, scientifically. But experientially, different, huge difference, isn't it? And that difference is only for you, the person who has gone there for you only. But if you want, that is because of this, the emotions are molded cognitively and you give a different value to it. If you want, you can develop a state, a type of control on your emotions. You can keep emotion arousal, what we say, at a necessary state, primary state, necessary state, without giving any type of molding to it. And use it as a drive, driving force for all activities. But it is a very, very difficult thing. And today we know that Probably this is what people achieve when they do meditation, when they sit and pray every day, 
you get that capacity to isolate your emotional arousal from cognitive processes. And once you have that type of control on your emotion, you can take a judgment over yourself, like in the same way you make a take judgment on another person. Not easy, not easy, but it is possible. And we have given up all these things. When it comes to cyber world, well, it is a reality. Today we know that when I see, I don't anymore feel lonely. I find that all my friends are with me all the time. Some of them are in the state, some of them are in the UK. Any moment I want, in two minutes I can contact them. It is our strength. It's a huge strength that we have. We cannot stop this. We are only going to grow further and further in this. But if you allow this to affect your emotion in a different manner, well, that can be a problem. That is what you all have to probably, I mean, when you say there is a difficulty in this area, there is difficulty in children, there is difficulty in people, the difficulty occurs in that cognitive molding of emotions. That needs to be done. And once you correct this, today you know that's also a fact. We use cognitive behavior therapy in all realms, all over the world. People use. You change your cognitive model molding, you find that what was so troubling you so much becomes no problem at all. So what is it? Not a problem because your cognition of the situation has changed. Your judgment has changed. Your emotional disturbances simply just disappear. Now these are things we have to sit and discuss. Probably I am very happy that we are talking about dealing with this virtual world or this type of cyber world in a healthy manner that is a necessity and it has brought us all so closer to one another but there are difficulties. How to handle these difficulties? That's something different. I hope that we will have a discussion I mean, had proper interaction on this. Probably it may not be possible to do that in one or two days. We may need several more such conferences, but we should have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, yes, you're very right that uh, the time is less, but you have begun that conversation about um, in this world of Maya, keeping emotions in control, very long, very difficult process, but at least if we can be aware that this needs to be done and start talking about it, I think that would be a good first step. So thank you very much, sir. And I invite uh, for the keynote address, Mr. Hasid Kazi.
is about technology, knowing who we are, and adapting to it. That's a, that's a huge shift. And if technology needs to adapt to who we are as human, I think the whole significance of psychology is very, very different. And there's already research going on from two aspects. One is the human behavior and what does it mean from an adaption of that technology to that human behavior? The contextualization of that, the localization. And the other important aspect is how our cognitive capabilities is being leveraged to bring about that adaptation. So I think what is going to be of relevance is the role of psychology in a very new cyber world which is not just about internet, which is not about social media, but that cyber world consists of many more devices. It consists of smart infrastructure and be able to relate to that. So that's what I would like to share a few thoughts and hopefully during the course of these two days we can reflect back on some of these points in the context of what we discussed. So let's just uh, for a moment uh, see the evolution, right? Uh, in three decades, and it's never been so quick, we have really seen all of us rapidly transition to a digital society. And what used to be our interaction with a PC in front of us and we browsing uh, or surfing the net for whatever reasons is now beginning to completely transform into a connected, adaptive and intelligent cyberspace. To illustrate I would like to show you all a video. So, a software defined world. How would the perfect accident work in a software defined world? You can increase the volume. Yeah. 
he knows that on his mobile phone there is a SOS button and he presses that. Okay. Imagine the entire medical system then coming into fear. An SOS message goes to the right a big health center or hospital, wherever he is uh, uh, you know, visiting. The, the understanding or the knowledge about the fact that a certain type of medication has been used uh, is being taken by this person. The ambulance being dispatched. While the person is in the ambulance, the constant monitoring that happens and the interconnect the connect with the hospital that he's being taken to. When he reaches there, the entire preparation, uh, preparation and the fact that if there are any precautions to be taken with respect to the surgery, uh, they are completely aware about it. Once released from the hospital, the person doesn't have to again travel maybe 20 kilometers, which is especially uh, true in many of our within cities, but also a lot in rural part of the country. Uh, goes to our nearest uh, public uh, health center and uh, connects with the doctor on a, on a video connect. But having all the records about his health condition and what he has been through available uh, because of the health information exchange uh, being in place. Right? So here the technology interface to the person who had a heart attack was just hitting on that SOS button and everything <coughs> worked in an integrated way to make sure that that person gets attended to very quickly and comes home healthy. Right? That's system of experience. One cannot create such system of experiences again without a deep understanding of the journey that each one of us take in our daily lives. And how in that journey, who do we connect with? And how are we of help to each other in our respective roles is very important to understand. We run a digital impact square, uh, it's a innovation center at NASIC. And while innovating for many of the societal impacts, we've really understood that this is so, so important. You cannot imagine to reduce maternal mortality if one doesn't have an appreciation of the challenges that the mother of pregnant women has at his household. The inability to go to a clinic The, how an AM interfaces with the mother uh, are, are extremely critical behavioral under, uh, patterns that has to be understood to eventually bring that experience and the outcome of reducing mental illness. Okay. So another important thing is that it's not going to be just about technology. It is about our human relationships. It is about our understanding and how we contextualize it to achieve an outcome. So can we do this just by ourselves? The answer is no. We have to bring many minds together, many minds where our strengths lies either the left brain or the right brain. We have both the brains, but we, our orientation based on academic background makes us better in a certain way. But if we have to address the humanization of technology, we have to bring both of these sides of the brain together. Which means we have to work in multidisciplinary teams. And also very important is what I said in the beginning. This is not about technology just put on us and say, okay, go use it and figure it out what's best for you. And then that's where needs the core issues that we are all talking about. But if we are going to play active role 
in understanding empathy of people. Based on that, determining what aspects of technology is going to be used and, and to what extent. And then the value maximization. What is the value that gets delivered to that person, to that beneficiary? It's so, so key. And if we take all of these three together, I think our whole focus will shift to make technology for the betterment of our daily lives versus we struggling with some of the issues that we have today on social platforms. So it's, it's very important as to where our time goes in the future, right, in trying to address more. So the key question that we should ask is if cyber psychology has to evolve from where it is today, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what role will it play in humanizing technology? And very important, and this is not just about our country, but I think globally, what role will it play in contextualizing digital literacy across the socio-economic strata of our society? Because again, we cannot bring that literacy without understanding who I am in part of So I believe responsible netizen has a great future and in a connected world, I think it will evolve itself also and get into some of the areas that uh, I just spoke about. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. And uh, we realize that uh, technology can be supportive and not just destructive. And uh, everyone has to play a role in that. Thank you for that message of humanizing technology. So with this, we come to the end of the inauguration segment of the program. I thank all the speakers. I'm not going to present a formal word of thanks because I think we're all part of the same movement. And uh, we'd like to take a 15 minutes break for tea. Tea is going to be served in the cafeteria on the same floor. And uh, before that, the guests can have a group photograph and the audience can proceed to tea. Thank you. 15 minutes. <laughs>